Guys, we have came a long way on my 2018 Dodge Demon project. When I brought it home from the salvage auction, it looked like this. Since then, a lot has changed. We scraped out what was left of the old interior and rebuilt it from the ground up. We restored the suspension and we even finished up the body of this formerly crispy demon. Well, it set paint and glass. But we'll get to that at some point. This week, it's all about filling the one gaping hole left in this build. And that was meant to be literal. It's an actual gaping hole. We built a thousand horsepower capable engine. We got a supercharger from Kong Performance, our donor six speed manual transmission, headers, a triple of this clutch from Mantic. Basically what I'm trying to say here is we have everything we need to get a drivetrain into the Demon for the very first time in maybe, just maybe, started. But as is probably quite obvious to every single one of you watching, before this can power that, we have a lot of work to do. Starting with dressing this engine. Last episode, we installed the blower, but underneath there are some issues. While we have rebuilt the engine itself, we've yet to address all the fire damaged accessories on the top and sides, some of which were burned so bad that I couldn't even tell what they were, which ultimately left us to try to outfit this engine via parts diagrams and looking at other engines we had here at the shop. Of course, one thing we can't just steal off every other engine, bolts, which means I've had to raid my box of spare Corvette hardware. I know some of the hardcore Dodge guys might find that a little sacrilegious, but hey, I think it's pretty fitting. At that point, it's Mopar powered by Corvette, right? That's how you know it's gonna be fast. Look at that. There's just something about working on parts that look like this, as opposed to what that's looked like for the past year that just hits a little bit different. We'll consider this our reward for spending all summer in a respirator shoveling burnt interior out of this thing. We're on to the fun part now. I did want to pull the lid just to make sure the inside of this blower was ready to go. I ordered a complete spare gasket kit for it, but it turns out when it was at Kong Performance getting ported, they did everything. They sent this thing back complete ready to go. Now I know what you're thinking. A torque wrench, really? after we installed a subframe with a forklift last episode. And hey, I agree, it all feels a little too by the book to me, which is why we're about to install this throttle body with no gasket, Toyota sealant, and Chevy bolts. And yes, I do realize how that sounds, but it's for a good reason. When we had this blower ported, they took off such a significant portion of the mating surface where it seals to the throttle body. This is about how much material our blower snout used to have, and now we have less than half that. Because of that, we're not going to be able to run a gasket. So the fix for that, of course, is RTV. It's a trick I've used on my ZR1, and here we are again. As for why we're using Toyota RTV, well, it's simply the best RTV known to man. And I'm not going to hear any arguments about Honda Bond or any other RTVs. Toyota's the goat of RTVs. If you used it, you know, and I will argue about it in the comments. Oh, whoops. <laughs> Next up on the to-do list, this water manifold that goes on the back of the supercharger. And unfortunately, we are gonna have to use a gasket. We're not gonna be able to RTV this one. We already had these blue O-rings, which are part of the intercooler brick assembly. They ensure no water gets out. These O-rings make sure no boosts gets out. I gotta say, this is pretty nice to see, considering the one we pulled off the Demon originally could be best described as molten. And now I think is probably the perfect time to fess up to a little mistake. These valve covers, they're about 400 bucks a pop. And one thing you should do 110% of the time before dropping $800 on valve covers is make sure you order the right color. As you can see, they are quite orange and the block is very, very red. Yep, I accidentally ordered Hellcat valve covers. For those of you who are unaware, like I was, Hellcat blocks are orange, Demon blocks are red, with red valve covers to match. I tried to get over it, I tried to tell myself it didn't matter, but in the end they just looked so bad I couldn't do it. I decided to sell these and order another set. And yeah, I did once again order the wrong one, but this time it was intentional. Once I saw what this black supercharger looked like on top of the engine, I couldn't help but think that we should order a set of black valve covers instead of the red ones and black out the entire top of the engine. Now I know given the color coordination we've just done here, that this might seem a little odd. But the stock coil packs turned to literal dust, so I think an upgrade was in order. While Rift Superchargers make season orange to match the Hellcat valve covers, I suppose in our case they're going to match, um, the intake gaskets and this microfiber. But hey, they have data to suggest that these are a slight upgrade over OEM, and given that they're not just an aesthetic mod like the valve covers, I can get down with a little mismatching. 
This is about what it'll look like, but let's not get ahead of ourselves because of the three systems required to start this car. We have spark, we definitely have air, but when it comes to fuel, we have absolutely none. So let's fix that. Starting with these guys, Injector Dynamics 1700 CC injectors. And for those of you measuring, that's over twice the size of the stock demon injectors, which are 700 cc. We're gonna be running E85 for fuel, so this is one area we definitely could not skip out on. We are, however, gonna run a stock fuel rail. This will flow all the fuel we could ever need, but there is a chance we may have to change this down the road to a return style rail to get the car to run properly on a manual transmission. That is one more thing down in fuel. And now, before we move on to solving a problem that requires a bit of brain power, we get to run around this pallet and install all of these parts. Well, uh, except the rods, we're gonna be giving more of those away later. So yeah, there's gonna be more rod jokes. Probably a few shaft jokes. Might even throw in a dick. We're looking up. Official now. We've upgraded the pallet from the engine pallet to the full drivetrain pallet, which means we are about this close to busting open that briefcase, connecting the engine and trans together, and throwing it all in the car. Can you just open it, please? Now, yeah, we got a problem to solve. Specifically, a belt problem. These cars run a two belt system, a 10 rib for the blower only, and then a six rib to control everything else. The blower belt goes on the inside, which means that's the one we need to take care of first. And while we haven't changed the configuration of this drive, we have changed the diameter of the upper pulley. And of course we've changed our lower pulley as well. On my ZR1, not only did we make the upper pulley smaller as we did here, we also increased the size of the lower pulley by 14%. This time though, we decided to stay with stock diameter. It's nearly eight inches, which is plenty big enough. Honestly, any more than eight inches is probably just a waste. Due to the fact that we only slightly decreased the diameter of the upper pulley, I'm pretty hopeful that this stock belt's gonna work for us. But we certainly didn't max out the tensioner. I think we're gonna be okay with that. We have a whole index finger plus some of travel left in the tensioner, so I think we're gonna get away without switching to a smaller belt, but that is definitely not gonna be the case on the accessory drive belt. On our thinner belt that's nice, loose, and sloppy, we're gonna have ourselves a bit of an issue because we decided to delete the AC. Seventy-seven inches, roughly. Oh. There we are. So the final fit for Demon AC Delete, 77 and 7 8 inches, which means it's time for this. Assuming the clutch is of the same quality as the packaging, I think we're going to be in great shape. This is a Mantic triple disc. It comes with every single thing we need to install it, a brand new OEM slave cylinder, ARP hardware, new flywheel. This should be able to handle all the abuse we could ever want to throw at this car. It's going to make sure every bit of power from this engine gets sent through the transmission into the rear wheels, which yes, we'll make sure we destroy it all in short order, but hey, we'll just use that as an excuse to upgrade down the road. Fancy. A little too fancy for this car, if we're being honest. It's a super light aluminum flywheel with a steel friction surface screwed on, which means it's replaceable in the discs. We've got three of these bad boys. Now, the way all these plates are gonna attach to this flywheel is a little different than clutches I've used in the past. We stick these bolts through and there's a recessed groove that's gonna lock it in place. This way, these bolts can't spin once we tighten it from the front when the clutch is assembled. Now your job, Fernando, stick this on the crank, hold it steady. Steady enough. Don't let it fall over. You all right? Yeah. See how yeah. steady. <laughs> I see you rocking up. <laughs> Solid work. It was it? Nice job. Okay. Motor's still standing up straight. The flywheel's torqued. Now you might be thinking the next thing we have to do is slam on all those clutch discs, bolt the clutch together, throw the trans on, and stick it in the car. Yeah, that would be the case if I didn't forget the pilot bearing. So now instead of doing all that fun stuff, I get to go desperately search a 20 mile radius and hope I can find one like right now. What's that SpongeBob meme? Something about three hours later. All this over a $10 bearing. I didn't realize until I tried to stick this pilot bearing inside the crank that the pilot sleeve for the automatic transmission is still in there. 
that didn't budge whatsoever. So new plan, we're gonna pull off the little slide and put the big slide from our huge slide hammer on it. It's either gonna break this thing instantly or that's coming out. I ain't gonna say it, you say it. We both know, no. we both know which one it's gonna be, right? That's coming. What about if the new one doesn't fit? Shut, <laughs> stop. <laughs> It just dawned on me that this is very similar to what we're doing with the drivetrain in this car. This is our thousand horsepower engine. This is our transmission struggling for dear life. And now we can move on with what we started like four hours ago. We're in. One more part. And then the last part, the pressure plate. The last bit of modification we have to do is replace this old stock slave cylinder with a new stock slave cylinder. Extra raggedy, not raggedy at all is the best way I can describe this. Now because this whole clutch assembly sits in just a little bit further than the factory one, we have to space this out with this billet adapter plate. Absolutely perfect. We shouldn't have any issues whatsoever getting this trans on. Guys, I thought I was hyped before, but seeing an engine and trans bolted together next to a car that's pretty much ready to have this thing dropped in, this is a new level. Can you believe this is finally happening? Yeah, this has been taking too long. It feels like something should go wrong right about now. <laughs> oh, way too much. It's off the pallet. Now the last thing I have to do on the subframe, which I definitely should have done before the engine was hanging in the air behind us, pull these motor mounts. This one off the red eyes all jacked up, presumably from the wreck. Either way, we got new ones, I'm done with them. And if it seems like I'm rushing right now, that's because I'm just a little terrified that this engine's about to hit the ground. This is extremely steady. I don't know exactly what kind of milestone this is, but it's something. The engine's not on a pallet, it's not on a stand. And it doesn't have any damage. Also, a very, very valid point. Now that we got our engine onto our subframe and I've breathed at least a minor sigh of relief, we can go over some of the differences I found when I was dressing this thing. Given that we're changing the transmission and we've straight up deleted some of the other systems on the car, it's definitely not gonna be a plug and play affair. Most of this stuff revolves around the wire harness. Certain wires like these that go to the AC compressor, we're just gonna leave unplugged. Other ones like this, I don't have a clue what it goes to, but we'll figure out later once we get it in the car. And then some wires like these that go to the transmission are just completely wrong. On the eight speed automatic that came out of this car, there was one plug and one plug only. It was internally controlled. It had a transmission control module. I guess technically in the manual transmission, I'm the transmission control module, but this trans has like three plugs and this doesn't plug into any of them. This six speed manual transmission is called a TR6060. And the center section, which is the important part, is the same as pretty much every other TR6060 that came to say a Camaro or Corvette. The tail section is different, the bell housing is different, but the sensors are the same. This two pin connector on the side, I believe is the vehicle speed sensor. I think this is reverse lockout and this is either gear shift position or skip shift. Luckily, I think that's all stuff we can take care of later. This wire is long enough that it's gonna hang down and we can do whatever hacking we need to do on it while it's in the car. The same goes for pretty much everything else. Any wire that's unaccounted for or broken and unused, we can take care of once it's in the car which means there's only one last thing we have to do before we stick it in. And of course, I'm talking about installing our fancy new headers. These guys are the two inch stainless works long tubes and they're designed specifically for the Challenger. So they should be a direct bolt on affair. 
And the one thing we're not gonna do today is make the same mistake twice. On my ZR1 build, I installed headers onto my brand new aluminum cylinder heads with stainless steel bolts. I, of course, promptly broke one because unbeknownst to me at the time, you need to lube them. It was an absolute disaster. I spent an entire night drilling it out, but believe it or not, once in a while, I do learn from my mistakes. That feels much better than the Chevy. These things fit awesome, they look great. The only little bit of modification we had to do is cut the dipstick tube just a little bit to clear whatever that pipe is. Compared to our stock headers, the location of the O2 sensors changed pretty significantly. It moved back quite a bit. Because of that, the factory O2 sensors wouldn't reach the bunks, but Stainless Works included an O2 sensor extension harness that we were able to plug in, making it a non-issue. So I uh, guess it's about time. Are you ready for it? I'm ready. 100%. Are you ready? <laughs> yeah. Uh, you don't sad. sound sure at all. It's just sad that I ain't gonna call the shale anymore. It's gonna be a car. And so car. you finally admit it. It is. For as big and wide as these engines are, it's sliding in way too easy. I fully expected there to be some kind of an issue, but there's really just not. Go ahead and send it down some more. I know it's not technically bolted in yet, but this is about where this is ultimately gonna sit. So I guess this is our first real look at this engine in the engine bay, and it looks awesome. It looks awesome, I like it. There's no other way to put it, it just looks awesome. Subframes bolted down, so by the book, the engine's installed. This is a great success, I suppose. But we still have to finish up mounting the transmission, so before we celebrate, we gotta gingerly put it in the air, hope the trans doesn't fall out of it, and then we can admire our work. Well, at least it's not gonna fall off the lift. That's a plus. Guys, I think it's official. Not only did we just bolt a manual trans into a demon for the very first time, but considering what the last transmission looked like, I'm just thrilled to not be able to see the inside of it. Not only did we just make ourselves a little bit of Mopar history, but we did so really easily. Everything just went smooth, which is not typically how this stuff goes. As monumental of a moment as having an engine in this car for the very first time is, I'm even more excited about the fact that this is gonna let us take another 10 steps forward. Now we get to outfit this engine bay, the cooling system, drive shaft, exhaust, pretty much all the fun stuff I've been waiting to do this entire time. Okay, so bleeding brakes isn't exactly fun, but hey, we had to do it. Hey, hit the brakes. Yep, it stops my hand. It can stop this 4,500 pound car, no problem. We have a working brake system. And while we were at it, I decided I wanted to try to do the clutch as well. That's when I got under here and realized that there is nowhere to bleed it. I decided to take a quick look at our old slave cylinder. And sure enough, there is nowhere to bleed this thing. Though at face value, it looks really similar to a GM one. The GM internal slave cylinders have a second port coming off it that lets you bleed it manually. Now, as one would do in a situation like this, I got to Googling and it turns out, unlike the brakes, they're self bleeding. You just have to press it in roughly 200 times and I mean while you're up there 612 613 614 you good no Fernando tired himself out stepping in Yeah, that'll do it. She feels good. I think more impressively than the fact that that all went super smooth is how light that Mantic triple is It feels like a stock clutch working clutch system working brake system Engine and trans in the car, say it. It's official car. It's a car. Louder. Yeah. Say it louder. Well, so they can all they don't make pressure on me. They get a crank first, you know? It, it's say it's it. not. Get, it's a, get a crank, get a yeah, start. You already said it. Just say it, it again. It's a car. After hearing that, half of me thinks we can just call this project a win right now, push it outside, move on to the next. But I suppose just for shits and giggles, we'll go ahead and get it running. As much as I want to outfit this engine bay right now and see what the end product's going to look like, all that stuff's pretty easy. So I think we'll start on the bottom with the exhaust and a drive shaft that needs just a little bit of love. The carrier bearing's absolutely shot. So order this thing. It's an aftermarket solution for busted up carrier bearings. Unfortunately, Dodge will not sell you a new carrier bearing. So if yours is busted up, that means you have to spend 900 bucks on a new drive shaft or $180 on an aftermarket replacement.
Then we just obsessively go over this and scrape off all the excess rubber. Slip this bad boy around here. Oh yeah. A little bit of the blue stuff. Well, the install was easy enough. Now I have heard that these can cause a little bit of a whine, some drivetrain noise. Needless to say, that's not my concern in the type of car we're building here. Now, as we were finishing up the shaft, another box of parts arrived and you're gonna laugh because it's a shifter. That's right, the very same shifter that would have taken us like 15 seconds to install if we did it before we put the engine and trans in the car but hey at least it showed up before we put the drive shaft in so we don't have to rip that right back out what is that i don't know we all know that looks aren't everything, but I'm pretty confident just based off looks that this is gonna be a significant upgrade. Not only that, this thing's all loose and flopping around. This is nice and tight. So now you're gonna be like 0.5 second faster. <sighs> This is more of a shifter feel type upgrade, not a shift speed upgrade. There is a reason that I ordered this and it is neither of those things. One of the big issues with the stock shifter is this single post rear mount. This Barton shifter uses a dual post. Now that's not necessarily our problem with the shifter. Our particular issue is that this single post rear mount, the one that looks a lot like this, is nowhere to be found. Sure, we could have ordered a $30, $40 replacement and stuck with the stock shifter, or we could have ordered a $450 aftermarket shifter. So any of that financial sense you thought I had because of that carrier bearing argument? Yeah, um, no. There's our transmission tunnel seal, somewhat pressed in place. And now for quite possibly the most important part we've installed to date. It's not officially a manual demon, unless it has a manual shifter. Ready, Fernando? Yeah. This is the first time anybody has done this in a demon and I am way too excited about it. What do you think it's gonna sound? <laughs> Something like, what? What? Then I'll go three, four, three and blow the whole thing to bits. That's officially side quest complete. And now we can hang this shaft. Nice. Gotta love me a manual transmission. A stuck in gear, just hit it with a pry bar. The drive shaft, it's done, it feels good, so we can check that off the list and get wrestling that exhaust. This is far and away the biggest exhaust I've ever installed. This might be the first one that's a three person job. Now, if there's one thing I truly hate on this earth, it's slip joint exhaust. Let me go ahead and rephrase. If I hate one thing on this planet, it's used slip joints. This stuff is nice. Sure, when we've been driving the car for 10 miles, they'll be locked together and I'll hate it when we have to pull it off, but for now, it's all right. There's our exhaust actuator, so it gets louder when we hit the gas. We just knocked out the entire underside of this car in really short order. That means now we only have to deal with what's right there. And theoretically, fingers crossed, it's gonna be ready to start. Which will of course open up an entire new can of worms. But hey, I suppose that's a problem for later. Now, where I wanna start on this front end is the radiator assembly. We have to build off of that for pretty much this entire front end job. So I think it just makes sense to knock this out first. Now, you might be looking at that piece right there and thinking that it should probably be installed with the radiator. This is the automatic transcore slash AC condenser assembly. And if you've been paying attention, you know we no longer need either of those things. We're gonna try to use our heads here, stand the radiator up straight on the lower mount and lower the car down on top of it. We're either going to crush the thing or it's going to go flawlessly. Do you got a replacement just in case? Nope. It might not be the most comfortable, but we're in. What's that old saying about it not being dumb if it works? I don't think it's like that. No, it goes exactly like that. <laughs> it ain't dumb if it works. That's the literal thing. Like I said, it ain't dumb if it works. Upper mounts done. Now, before we get to plumbing this, I want to finish the heat exchanger system, the system that cools the supercharger. This cooler you can see in the front is the main heat exchanger. Typically on a red eye or a demon, cars that use that AC assisted heat exchanger system, that would be the 
only heat exchanger. Being that we got rid of the AC, that means we're getting rid of this giant messy AC assisted intercooler system and all the lines that go with it. Considering we're getting rid of that, just until we can run our ice box system a little bit later down the road, we're gonna use a trick that they used on the older Hellcats that didn't come with that AC intercooler system and add a second cooler. The pump itself is gonna mount to this bracket and as for the cooler assembly, I haven't quite figured that out. The pumps themselves on both these systems are exactly the same and it plugs into this massive connector that I labeled IC for intercooler as if there's anything else this could possibly plug into. I'm not sure I understand. Well, it's not that hard to be honest, Siri. I think you should be able to pick that up pretty well. On the pump, we're good to go. It's solid. As for the cooler, I was slightly concerned that we weren't going to have the proper mounting provisions given that this chassis was never meant to come with this auxiliary cooler. But Dodge did us a solid. This cooler mounts entirely to the front bumper beam. And though this is the original front bumper beam from the Demon, if you can't tell because it has soot all over it and some damage, they left the provisions to mount this thing. Mounted, great, awesome, now we have to plumb it. I saved an entire line, a reservoir set out of another Hellcat, but as for figuring out where everything goes, the only one that's immediately obvious is this guy. This one goes from the auxiliary cooler to the main cooler, but with the rest of them, it's gonna be a bit of trial and error. I'm thinking this long section runs down under the car, and this nipple goes to the one exposed hose on the pump, but it is a tight fit. Straight down between the headlight and radiator shroud, you see that we found the other hose that goes to the main heat exchanger. That runs through the core support and up here to this other nipple on the silver hard line. With that line handled, that means the only things we have left to account for are this reservoir, which plugs in right there, and then the two larger lines that run back to the water manifold on the back of the supercharger. For those, I'm at least somewhat confident that these rubber lines off of 2020 are gonna work, even if the hard lines are significantly different. The heat exchanger cooling system is far and away the most complex cooler we're going to install in this car, but it's definitely not the most important. Of course, I'm talking about the engine oil cooler. So simple, yet so important. This one only has two lines. They plug in right to the oil filter housing, and fortunately, we have one that's in pretty decent shape out of a Hellcat. Funny enough, this is the original one out of the Demon. And while I did get a tire thrown into it and the upper mounts ripped off, it wasn't leaking, so maybe this is good for something. But to be on the safe side, instead of trying to repair this one, we're just going to use the clean fresh this is the bracket for it that's off yet another car that should mount just like that. Now we should be able to hang this like so. Well, not quite as easy as I thought. But there we are, we did it anyway. Unlike the heat exchanger line routing where we had to do a little guessing, there is pretty much no mystery where these things go. If I can get it in. There we go. That does it for all three of the coolers on the front of this car. And somewhat like the exhaust did yesterday, this just went way too easy. Sure, it may have taken until episode eight before things started going smooth for us, but hey, I guess we can't complain. And with that done, it's almost a surreal feeling, but we are this close to starting this thing. One last piece I want to install, even though it's not technically required to start it, this improved racing catch can. They make a sick universal catch can that they've adapted specifically for the Challenger chassis. It comes with pre-made bent hoses with OEM type fittings. The catch can, you can just open it up like that. It's absolutely wild. I know this is kind of dumb, but one thing I really like about it is the fact that it has some green in it. So it'll match our green belt. Granted, we put a used green belt on here and it looks pretty much black, but one day we'll put a new belt on it and we'll have a little bit of green in our engine bay. Now that we've done all this work, this is the point where we should be able to put oil in it and start it. Except we don't have an ECU. One single module is the only thing holding us up from at least trying to start the demon for the first time. Honestly, I don't even know how this is going to turn out once we have the ECU, but for now, all I can do is wait. Fortunately for you guys, it's going to be like 15 seconds. For me, it might be a week. What I actually meant to say was it might take three weeks, but nonetheless, we have our ECU back. It's fully flashed to a manual operating system, and that's the end of the good news here. It is 
all downhill from this point on. Now I knew we we're gonna be in for a fair bit of work once it came time to handle the electrical side of this swap, but I may have underestimated exactly how hard of a problem it was gonna to be to solve. Once we got the ECU in it, I realized the car was really unhappy and you'll see why I'm doing this whole thing in just a second. When you try to start it or even power it up, it gives you that warning. The service transmission, it's thinking that it still has an automatic and that it's stuck in gear. Hey, no problem, right? Let's just stick an automatic shifter back in it, put it in park, and then it'll think it's in park, right? Yeah, I guess putting the shifter in it with no automatic transmission probably won't work out. So naturally, the next thing on the agenda was to take that red eye transmission, which I did luckily still have laying around, stick it under the car and plug it in. At this point, every single part from the red eye that needs to be connected to this chassis to have it theoretically start is connected and it's just not working. It looks like the reason for that is that the body is automatic and the ECU is manual. Quite ironically, if we had not flashed this ECU and just left it alone as an automatic, we would have been able to temporarily start this car. There would have been nothing preventing it from firing, though we would have to flash it to menu at some point, so that start would have been really for nothing more than show. So now we need to trick the chassis of this car into thinking it's a manual. I was naively optimistic that it was just going to be pinning some connectors at the transmission, maybe the ECU, and we'd fire it up and drive ourselves right out of the shop. Well, if it were that simple, we wouldn't be having this whole conversation right now. I'd have done it and the car would be running. So I started looking for alternatives to make the chassis think that it was manual. What would be the easiest, cleanest, and most proper way to do it would be to swap out this front harness, swap out the engine harness, the body control module, and the RF hub that's in the back of the car with ones from a manual car. It'd be essentially no wiring. We would plug in the new harnesses, flash the BCM, and be good to go. It sounds like a no-brainer, and it would be if those parts were available. Dodge lists most of these parts as either unavailable or straight up discontinued. So the next place I looked, naturally, the salvage auction, the used market. There's not a single manual 2018 and up Hellcat at salvage auction anywhere in the country. So that leaves us with essentially only one option to get this car back on the road. Dissect the electrical system all the way from the front to the rear and try to trick what's a surprisingly complex car. It's not only allowing us to start it, but having it function properly while missing half the stuff it was supposed to come with. The only hiccup in this whole genius plan I've cooked up is that uh, this is what I'm qualified to wire. And this is not that. I have spoke with a lot of people who are much more knowledgeable in Mopar wiring than myself, and their answers have ranged from, you need to find those harnesses, to, I think we can make it work, to straight up, and I quote, what you're doing will never work. Look, this whole bill, we've been overcoming challenge after challenge. I suppose it's only fitting that there's one more, even if it is the biggest one yet, that hit us like a metaphorical rod to the face. And yeah, that is a very non-subtle transition into the fact that we are giving away a couple more rods out of the original Demon Engine. You showed up hoping to watch the project that you've been following for the last year start for the first time, and instead you're leaving with the chance to win something that should probably be in a trash can. I'd be disappointed too. But judging by how many people were willing to go down in the comments and tell me they loved my rod a few videos ago, it seems like this is a worthy consolation prize. I do feel like there's a limit to how many rod jokes we can make, so we're just going to cut that one right here instead. Next video, if all goes according to plan, which it probably won't, but hey, here's the hoping, we're going to dyno the car. So go down in the comments and tell me how much power you think this is going to make. The two people closest to it will win my rod. There's no good way to say it, I know. Not only do I want this thing running because I think it's gonna be awesome to drive and I'm genuinely looking forward to it, but also for you guys who've been showing incredible support for this entire series. I essentially had to make a decision whether we hold this video until we can get it started or just let it fly and give you guys an update on where we stand in. Clearly, you see which route I took. I'm hoping that the next video is gonna make up for it. Not only will we start it, but drive it and dyno it as well. But until then, I guess I'm going to learn how to wire a demon. In the meantime, I am going to make it a point to post periodic updates on my own channel so I don't leave you guys hanging until whenever it is that this thing's finished. And I'll have the link to that down in the description. Adios. Nice. Off to a rocking start. We <laughs> haven't even started the intro. <laughs> and I'm already breaking stuff. But this week, it's all about filling the one gaping hole as I missed the hood latch. <laughs> Look at this TikToker. This is cool. Awesome. You're gonna be that. Wee! I have a problem. I don't have a pilot bearing. Oh, God. oh my God. Oh my I God. This entire setup. Now, the last thing we have to do on the subframe 
get the right size socket first. <laughs> now the one thing we're not gonna do today is make the stain same as not stain mistake. <laughs> He's not gonna crank. I literally just said that it doesn't have an ECU. No, I'm talking about with the ECU. It'll crank it, it, when it has an ECU. Hey. It has to crank with an ECU. 